Good day everyone, welcome back to Yellow Submarine, your dedicated Beatles channel. It's great to see you again. In this video, we'll break down the connection between the Beatles' White Album and the gruesome murders committed by Charles Manson and his followers. But first, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to get notified whenever a new video is uploaded. One of the darkest aspects of the Beatles' career was the misguided belief by the psychopathic murderer Charles Manson and his family of followers that the group's songs incited violence and depicted Armageddon. You've probably heard the words Helter Skelter before. In fact, the first thing you probably learned about the Manson family was that they killed people to start Helter Skelter, a race war. But just what exactly was Helter Skelter, and how did Manson come to believe it? How were the Beatles connected to the whole debacle? Keep watching to find out more. The Beatles released their ninth studio album, a double album, in November 1968, which marked the end of their psychedelic era and the beginning of their contemplative final years together. The album was originally titled The Beatles, but it's been recognised by its variant title since its release due to its stark white cover. Charles Manson was a huge Beatles fan, who first discovered their music while serving time at Washington's McNeil Island Penitentiary. He was taking guitar lessons from Alvin Creepy Carpus, an old gangster from the Mar Barker gang of the 1920s while at McNeil. Carpus was one of several older inmates who recognised the young man's ability and wanted to give him something useful, and in this instance, guitar instruction. Manson wasn't horrible at all. His training was unconventional, but he was gifted. During this period, he was introduced to the Beatles' music and the band had an indelible influence on him. Manson, according to Carpus, desired to perform music, write his songs and be renowned. During his stay at McNeil, Manson composed between 80 and 90 original songs. In the spring of 1968, he had the good fortune to meet Dennis Wilson, the Beach Boys drummer. Dennis believed Manson had a shot in the music business and introduced him to several significant people, including talent agent Greg Jacobson, singer Neil Young and producer Terry Melcher. Each of these persons encouraged Manson to pursue a great career in the music industry. Enter Spahn Ranch Manson and his followers lived with Dennis Wilson for a short period before moving to Spahn Ranch, a dilapidated 500-acre ranch in Chatsworth, California in the summer of 1968. Spahn Ranch had been used as a backdrop for Western films and television series by certain studios, but it was in terrible shape by the late 1960s. The family was allowed to stay at the ranch by owner George Spahn, a blind 79-year-old, because they helped maintain the land, managed the pony rides, and cooked and kept the house for him. After dusk, a few of the women kept his company, if you know what we mean. During the summer of 1968, Manson and the family used this as a base of operations. However, after Susan Atkins, Sadie, gave birth to a newborn boy at Spahn's, Manson's knew he had outstayed his welcome. He made plans for everyone to be relocated to Death Valley. Relocation to Death Valley After moving to Death Valley, Manson began to feel disappointed, as he thought that all he had done was love his family and he had nothing to show for it. What happened to his recording career? What happened to the fame and fortune he deserved? It wasn't supposed to be like this. Manson disappeared in November of that year. He decided to abandon his family in the middle of Death Valley out of spite, frustration and fury. He packed some leftover coffee and day-old bread and went out to the Panamint Mountains. He was no longer angry by evening, but he was fatigued. He went to sleep and awoke in a much better mood, with a single goal in mind to enhance his musical abilities and land that recording contract. When he returned to his followers, a few of them flew to Los Angeles to help Wilson, Jacobson and Terry Melcher get to the studio. Manson listened to the White Album for the first time shortly after returning to Los Angeles. The lads from Liverpool's White Album has some of the most instrumentally mature pieces. Each song was brilliant and some of the Beatles' greatest. What fans didn't realise at the time was that the White Album was the band's first major split. Drummer Ringo Starr left the group for a short time before returning just ahead of the studio schedule, and that it sowed the seed for their death less than two years later. Manson didn't sense the Beatles' impending breakup, but he did pick up on a message he thought was seething beneath the surface of the songs. Four songs in particular blew Manson away. Piggies, which criticised Western culture's avarice, Sexy Sadie, Blackbird, and of course, Helter Skelter. Manson supposedly had a vision while listening to the White Album in what we can only guess was an acid-induced delusion. He witnessed what he thought was Armageddon, a global cataclysmic war between whites and blacks. Remember, Manson was influenced by white supremacists in his early years. It was his early experiences that led him to assume that mixing races would result in conflict. 
Although the 1960s were a progressive era, not everyone was woke when it came to race relations. Manson wasn't exactly progressive when it came to race or gender for that matter. In his opinion, white men ran the world. Many songs on the White Album were held up by Manson as evidence that his vision was right, that the Beatles were aware of it, and that their lyrics include hidden messages for the family. The Outlandish Misinterpretation Anyway, Manson didn't start following what he felt the Beatles were saying after listening to the White Album. The situation was reversed. He mistook the Beatles to be discussing what he had been saying. He had the impression that they were singing about his ideas. He took the song Helter Skelter to indicate the blacks were going to go up and the whites were going down. Helter Skelter did more than just fulfill Manson's prediction of a racial Armageddon. It validated a long-held belief that he was doomed to achieve greatness at the expense of others. It proved that he was a high-ranking being, a master and a messiah. It told Manson that desiring the destruction he saw coming was acceptable and good because he stood to benefit personally. He believed he tapped into history's biggest prophecy. He was entrusted with a monumental task to accept a global dominion mission. Because he believed the Beatles told him so, he knew it was true. The Helter Skelter Manson continued to listen to the record after his initial vision and discovered more hidden clues in the lyrics. As a result, his vision began to broaden. He warned his supporters that a race war was on the way and that it would start in Los Angeles. Helter Skelter will start with a single event and quickly grow into a hand-to-hand -hand combat in the streets of Los Angeles, Manson promised his family. The city would soon be engulfed in flames and the war would quickly expand to other cities in the United States and other countries. The globe would eventually be embroiled in war. He thought it was because he was listening to the White Album and seeing a vision of a global battle coming shortly. Black people would assault white people and white people would retaliate in large numbers. Numbers. Black people, on the other hand, had been on the down for so long that it was now their turn to rise. All white people on the earth would be slain or enslaved, but Manson and his followers would hide in a cavern beneath Death Valley to avoid the war. There were flowing streams of fresh water, pockets of clear air, and places to produce food in the cavern, which was covered with crystals. He also assured them that he saw the family expanding to 144,000 people, and that they would be safe and free. However, after a few years, the world's dark leaders would realize they lacked the abilities to manage it, and they would come to the cavern and implore him to take over. Manson and his followers would then become sovereign rulers, ruling the world in peace for the rest of their lives. While the outcome of his vision was rosy, he warned them that the process would almost certainly not be. He predicted that there would be mayhem, with violent battles on city streets, engulfed communities, fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat, and bodies stacked from one coast to the next. He underlined the importance of remaining strong and steadfast. Unless they inoculated themselves against the violence and peacefully retired to the desert, they would witness horrific things and risk death. As late 1968 turned into early 1969 and Manson's chances of landing a record deal dwindled, talks of Helter Skelter got louder. The Manson family had returned to Spahn Ranch during the summer of 1969 and Manson was getting increasingly deranged. He was said to be abusing heavy narcotics which he generally banned others from using. The family was also broke, hungry and under increased scrutiny from police enforcement which was keeping an eye on their every move including auto theft. In the same year, a member of the Watson family, Charles Tex Watson, robbed a black heroin dealer of $2,500 and fled the scene. If the money wasn't returned, the drug dealer called Spahn Ranch and threatened to come there and slice everyone's throats. Manson agreed to meet the man, and when the dealer refused to be appeased, he shot him in the chest point blank before fleeing to Spahn Ranch. He needed to flee Spahn Ranch and return to Death Valley, but he lacked the financial means to do so. He needed Helter Skelter to happen for him to save his chicken shit ass. As a result, he decided to start Helter Skelter himself, telling his followers that the war was about to begin and that they needed to show black people how it was done. While not all of Manson's followers believed in Helter Skelter, the women Manson chose, Susan Atkins, Patricia Kasabian and Leslie Van Houten, had been coached for months on the inevitability of Helter Skelter, the importance of surviving the war, the importance of bracing themselves against the gruesome things they would see in the city and of course, the constant challenge of proving themselves to Manson. Charles Manson attempted to start Helter Skelter by having his followers murder white people in affluent neighborhoods and blaming it on black people. He was desperate for fame, money, success and power. Even though Helter Skelter was not the true purpose for the killings, it played a significant role in the murders that landed Manson and several of his followers in prison for the remainders of their lives. Amongst those murdered by Manson and his followers were Sharon Tate, Leno LaBianca and his wife Rosemary and others. They even had the guts to write Rise and Death to Pigs and Helter Skelter on the walls of their victims' homes.
If you enjoyed the video, make sure you drop a like and subscribe. Oh, and turn on post notifications. Now, if you'll excuse me, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.